Hi, thanks for joining me today. I've got a very different type of video. I'm going to be going through the Oxford University's maths admissions test. Uh, they're changing the format this year. So this is uh, the new format and they've released kind of a sample paper for candidates to try. And I'm going to have a go at it. I've not seen it before. Um, so I will be seeing these questions first time um, and solving them live. So very different to the videos I normally make. Anyway, just to give you a bit of a background on this, this test normally takes two and a half hours. Um, I'll see how I find it. I'll, I'll, if I think it's getting a bit boring, I might just stop the video um, or maybe I'll try and power through the whole thing. Um, and I'm just gonna be working through my solutions. It's a non-calculator exam. Um, there are 25 multiple choice questions. Um, and then after that, there are two longer questions, um, which will involve maybe a bit more discussion and thought. So I'm gonna dive right in. Um, but yeah, good luck to anyone who's doing the math. I'll try and leave some timestamps of the specific problems down below. Do uh, pause the video on each question if you want and give the, give the problem a go. Anyway, I'm going to stop waffling. I'm going to dive right in here. So I think I need to click next. Uh, yes, I'm ready to begin this exam. Okay, amazing. A square has center three, four and one corner at one, five. Another corner is at which of these vertices? Okay. My first thought is let's sketch a picture. So uh, annoyingly, I, well, I thought maybe I can use straight lines. Let's use straight lines here. So there is, there are my axes. Okay, so three, four is maybe roughly speaking there. So that's three, that's four. And one, five, one is maybe there and then five is up here. Um, so we have the center is there and one of the corners is there. So broadly speaking, our square will maybe look something like like that, not drawn perfectly, but okay, that will do. Okay, so where is another corner? In fact, it doesn't necessarily have to be parallel to the axes. Maybe, uh, hmm, maybe it looks something like like this. Um, I have to have a think about that. Okay, uh, we want to know where one of the other vertices is. Well, one thing I do know is that if I go this vector here, I can just do that again, um, and so that will definitely guarantee to get me to another vertex of my square. So let me see if that does anything nice for me. So. This, remember, is 1, 5. Oh, that's 1, sorry. That's 5. So what's this vector here? Well, I'm going 2 to the right and minus 1 down. So if I do that again, it's another 2 minus 1. Where am I going to get end up? Well, I'm going to end up at 5. Uh, oh, the coordinates here would be 5. And that would be 3. So it definitely has 5, 3 as a vertex. OK, cool. That's not one of the other options. No worries. OK, so now I can maybe think about the corners here and here, uh, wherever those are. Um, how can I work those out? Well, maybe I can eyeball it um, and go, okay, this one here is five, three. Um, this one here is one, five. So maybe this is this is what, two, three, four in the middle. So that would make this five, five. And this one here would be one, three. Uh, and that checks out, right? This got a side length, two there, two there, two there, two there. Perfect, yeah. So five, five is another vertex. So the answer is that guy there. Cool. Let's move on to the next one. I feel maybe I spent a bit too much time on that one. We'll see. Let's look at question two. Okay. What is the value of the integral from naught to one of e to the x minus x times e to the x plus x? I think this is just one which we can just uh, calculate. It's a difference of two squares. So it's going to be e to the two x minus x squared dx. And that's going to be a half e to the two x minus one third x cubed from one to zero which is going to be a half e squared minus a third um, minus a half. Uh, when you plug in zero there, you get e to the zero, which is one. And so this is going to be a half e squared minus a third minus a half is minus five sixths. Uh, so, oh, they put them on the same denominator. So 3e squared minus five over six. So that would be option D there. Sweet, awesome. Let's continue. Uh, more just a computation question. I don't think there are any tricks for that one. Okay, a nice classic math style problem. I think this this very problem has been in a previous map before. Uh, what's the value of one minus four plus nine minus 16 and so on? How do we tackle this? Well, there's a bunch of ways you can do it. Uh, I think the easiest way is to, to spot some pairs. So if I uh, maybe pair these guys together, I get minus three. If I get nine and minus 16 together, I get minus seven. The next terms would be plus 25 minus 36. That's going to give me minus 11 and so on all the way to this, which will be 99 squared minus 100 squared, which is uh, 99 plus 100 times 99 minus 100. So that's going to be minus 199. 
Okay, cool. So we're just adding this up. This is just an arithmetic sequence. The first term is uh, minus three. The common difference is minus four. How many terms are there here? Well, it's the number of pairs that we had originally. And there are 100 terms. We're putting them in pairs, so there's going to be 50 terms. And so we can just now use the formula, which you need to memorize for the mat. There's going to be n over 2, so 50 over 2 times 2a uh, plus n minus 1 times d. And so this is going to be 25 times uh, minus 6. 49 times minus 4 is going to be minus 196. Um, and then that's going to be 202 times 25, or minus 202 times 25, uh, which is what? Minus 101 times 50, which is going to be minus 5050. So the, it's, the answer is the first option there. Um, yeah, that's exactly how you want to answer this. I, I'm, I'm scared now that as I'm doing this, I may just be making some silly uh, al al algebraic errors as I go. But it's uh, I guess that's part of the map. You know, you've got to be focused. And also I'm trying to talk through my solutions at the same time. Anyway, let's have a look at this one. A regular dodecagon is a 12-sided polygon with all sides the same length and all internal angles equal. If I construct a regular dodecagon by connecting 12 equally spaced points on a circle of radius 1, then what is the area of the polygon? Okay, let me read that again. A regular dodecagon is a 12-sided polygon with all sides the same length. Okay, cool. If I construct a regular dodecagon by connecting 12 equally spaced points on the radius of a circle, what's the area of the polygon? Ah, okay, cool. So let's draw a circle first. Uh, we'll do we'll draw a nice big circle. Uh, something like this. And the center of our circle is maybe here. And we're making a dodecagon out of this by choosing 12 equally spaced points. So we can think of like a clock, I guess. Uh, something like this. And we're going to have 12, essentially, of these triangles um, kind of scattered around the circle. So I just need to work out the area of one of them and then uh, multiply that by 12. Well, what's the area of one of these guys? Uh, well, we can just use the formula half AB sine C. The radius is 1, so this is going to be a half times 1 squared times sine of this angle. 360 degrees divided by 12 is 30. And so that's going to be a quarter. So each triangle has area 1 quarter, and then we're multiplying that by 12, so the answer is 3. Sweet. Okay, cool. Let's move on to the next problem. Question 5. The positive number a satisfies this integral here, the integral from 0 to a, of root x plus x squared dx is 5, if a equals which of one of these numbers? Um, I think for this one, you just got to evaluate the integral. So we've got x to the half, so that's going to be 2 thirds x to the 3 over 2, and then plus 1 third x cubed um, from a to 0, and this is what 5 equals. Let's just sub this in, so we get 2 thirds a to the 3 over 2 plus 1 third a cubed uh, equals 5. When you plug in zero, you get zero. Okay, cool. Let's multiply by three on both sides. So 15 equals 2a to the 3 over 2 plus a cubed. And now I notice that this is just a hidden quadratic. Just to make it explicitly clear, let's call u a to the 3 over 2. Then this becomes 15 equals 2u squared plus, uh, sorry, 2u plus u squared, like so. Or in other words, u squared plus 2u minus 15 is zero. And so that's going to be u plus 5, u minus 3 is 0. And that's going to tell us that u is minus 5 or u is 3. Um, but u has to be positive because it involves square rooting a number. So a here is uh, positive. So when you do to the 3 over 2, it's going to be a positive number. So we can ignore that. So u is 3. So a to the 3 over 2 is 3. Squaring both sides gives you a is 9. Or a cubed is 9. So a must be the cube root of nine. Oh, well, that's the same as this. So it's the fourth option, um, just by taking this equation and raising both sides to the two thirds. Okay, cool. Let me know how you're going on so far. I, I can't tell how long this video is so far. Uh, I've got 141 minutes left, according to the top corner. Um, I'm enjoying it so far. It seems, uh, seems pretty standard so far. Uh, question six. Tangents to y equals e to the x are drawn at p comma ep and uh, q comma e to the q. These tangents cross the x-axis at a and b, respectively. It follows that for all p and q, which of these kind of conditions is true? OK, interesting. Let us draw a picture, of course. So start with uh, some axes. Notice that I'm not going to draw 
the negative half of the plane because I know e to the x won't ever enter into that territory. So e to the x looks something like this. Let me use some colors here to make it a bit clearer. So we've got a point here, p e to the p, let's say. And let's use a different color for, uh, for u. And that goes there. OK, cool. We've got tangent. So that's, what would the tangent here look like? Roughly speaking, something like that. Uh, oh, let's draw it long enough so it intersects the axes. Something like that, maybe. And then this guy here, maybe something like that, roughly. OK, cool. Um, so uh, A and B, so the P one is A. That one there is B. Uh, it follows that for all P and Q, which of these is true? OK, so firstly, I think I need to work out what A and B are in terms of P and Q. Let's uh, look at this here. Let's just do uh, some, some basic calculus. What is the gradient of the curve at this point? Well, very standard property of e to the x is that the gradient there will be e to the P. So this blue line here has equation uh, y equals e to the Px plus some constant. And to work out that constant, I'm just going to plug in x is P. Uh, and if I do that, I know that the y value should be e to the p. So e to the p equals e to the p times p plus c. And so c equals uh, e to the p, and I'll put 1 minus p, like so. OK, cool. Um, so what does this, uh, what's the equation of this tangent then? It's going to be y equals e to the px plus uh, c, which we've worked out is e to the p 1 minus p. And what about the green guy? Green guy, something similar, y equals e to the q times x plus e to the q times 1 minus q. Okie dokie, cool. And how do we work out a and b? Well, a we get by substituting y is 0. So if I get e to the p a plus e to the p 1 minus p equals 0, um, dividing by e to the p, I get a plus 1 minus p equals 0. And similarly, I'll get b plus 1 minus q is zero and I'm looking for um, maybe an equation which involves adding them up. So if I add these two equations up, I get a plus b, or maybe I want to subtract them actually to get rid of the ones. So a minus b, the ones will cancel, uh, minus p plus q equals zero. And so a minus b equals q minus p, which is going to be, yeah, I think, a minus B, which one's that? Uh, do I want this in another form? Uh, hmm. Wait, have I messed up the algebra here? I have messed up the algebra. This is supposed to be P minus Q. So A minus B is P minus Q, uh, which is the same as this guy. You can rearrange it to give you that guy. Okay, cool. So maybe I should have kept my eyes open at the options there. Um, but cool, that's the answer for that one. Okay, let's continue. Um, question seven. The area of the region bounded by the curve y equals e to the x and the curve y equals one minus e to the x and the y-axis is what? Notice here they've given the y-axis. Normally we integrate uh, with the x-axis. So let's draw a picture, of course. So y equals e to the x. Something like that y equals 1 minus e to the x is, let me change color. So that's going to pass through the origin, uh, and it's going to look something like uh, this, maybe. And then the y-axis. So we're looking for this area here. Um, OK, well, we can maybe do that by considering uh, what that point of intersection is. We can just do some algebra to work that out. So e to the x equals 1 minus e to the x. So e to the x equals 1 half. And so x equals ln of a half, um, or minus ln 2. And so therefore, how do we work out this area? Well, we can now turn it into a dx integral. It's going to be the integral from ln 2, or minus ln 2, sorry, to 0 of the top curve minus the bottom curve. So e to the x minus the bottom curve, which is 1 minus e to the x dx. Um, yeah, and just calculating that. So integral from minus ln 2 zero of oh, that's going to be 2e to the x minus 1 dx which is going to be 2e to the x minus x 
from zero to minus ln two. Uh, so that's going to give me two minus uh, two e to the minus ln two. That's going to be two times a half, which is one uh, minus or plus ln two. So that's going to give me one minus ln two, uh, which is going to be that guy there. So the answer is the second guy. Okay, cool. Let's do the next guy. Question eight, how many real solutions X are there to the equation X times modulus X plus one equals three modulus X? Ah, these questions I love. There's a bunch of ways you can attack this. Um, you can maybe try and sketch this. You can maybe try and uh, think about various values of X. I think I'm gonna do that here because I noticed that both of these modulus uh, functions are both just modulus X. It would be maybe a bit more fiddly if one of them was modulus X and one of them was like modulus X minus one. Uh, all I'm going to do here is split this into two cases. So if x is negative first, then what does this equation become? It becomes x times minus x plus 1 equals 3 times minus x. Let's just solve this. So minus x squared plus 1 equals minus 3x. Bringing everything on one side, x squared minus 3x minus 1 equals 0. Now, I don't actually need to solve this. I could use a quadratic formula to solve this. But if I just think about a sketch of this, it's a positive quadratic, and it's got y-intercept minus 1. Um, and in fact, the turning point is going to occur when x is 3 over 2. That bit's not super relevant, but it's going to look something like this. In particular, it has one negative, one positive root. Obviously, I'm assuming here x is negative. So this guy gives me one possible solution, whatever this number here is. I can work it out, but I'm not interested in it. Let's now consider if x is at least 0. What happens here? Well, this equation just becomes x squared plus 1 equals 3x, or x squared minus 3x plus 1 equals zero. And now for this, maybe I do want to just use a quadratic formula. The x is going to be uh, three plus or minus the square root of b squared, so nine minus four ac all over two, which is three plus or minus root five over two. Uh, root five is less than three. So both of these solutions here will be positive. So I'm going to get two extra solutions here. So the answer here is three. It's also kind of annoyed me how these numbers aren't in ascending or descending order. Anyway, Right, let's continue. Um, cool. Question nine. 100 circles all share the same center and they're named C1, C2, C3, and so on up to C100. I think this was on last year's map question, uh, map paper, one of the recent ones. Um, anyway, for each whole number n between 1 and 99 inclusive, a tangent to circle Cn crosses circle Cn plus 1 at two points that are separated by a distance of 2. Given that C1 has radius 1, it follows that the radius of C100 is 10 to 1 root 10 or root 100. Um, so yeah, I think this is pretty much the same problem as, as last year. Let, let, let's think about how we how do this. Let's just start by drawing a picture. So we're going to start with C1, which is a circle of radius 1. So let's draw that here. So there's our C1 circle of radius 1, like so. And how are we drawing C2? So C2 is going to um what is it it, it crosses this uh so we have a tangent to c1 crosses c2 at two points so we need to draw a tangent to c1 let's see this guy here and c2 is going to be a slightly bigger circle let's do this in red maybe like that and it's going to intersect this tangent at two points namely this guy and this guy, and that distance there is going to be 2. Okay, cool. Um, we want to know maybe what's the radius of this second circle, C2. Well, we can just do some basic Pythagoras. That's the thing we're trying to work out, the radius. That distance there is 1. That distance there is also 1 because it's the radius of C1. And so the radius of C2 is just going to be square root of 1 plus 1, which is root 2. Great. Okay, the radius of C2 is root 2. Okay, what about if we continue this? If I draw C3, so I'm going to first draw a tangent of C2. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll do it on this side so it doesn't get too crowded on that side. And then I'm going to draw a circle. So this circle, slightly bigger radius. And again, it's going to intersect this red line at two points. Um, these guys here. And that distance there, again, is going to be two. What's the radius of C3? Well, we can do the same thing. That's the length we're interested in. We know that distance is the radius of C2, which we worked out was root 2, and that there is 1, half of 2. So the radius of C3 is square root of root 2 squared 
plus one squared, which is going to be root three. And now we can kind of see the pattern. It's going to go one, root two, root three, root four, root five, and so on. So the radius of C100 is going to be root 100, which is 10. Cool. Let's continue. Yeah, a bit annoying that they haven't used completely new questions. Hey, hey. Um, the equation x squared minus 4kx plus y squared minus 4y plus 8 equals k cubed minus k is the equation of a circle if and only if some conditions on k. Um, so I think I've seen a similar problem to this before. Let's just do the bog standard thing and try and write this in the form of the equation of a circle. Oh, whoops. Um, so this is going to be x minus 2k squared plus y minus 2 squared. Uh, what have we got then? Minus 4k squared minus 4 plus 8 equals k cubed minus k. So x minus 2k squared plus y minus 2 squared. Uh, let's shove everything on the right side. So we're going to get k cubed plus 4k squared minus k uh, minus 4. Cool. And we want this to be an equation of a circle. There's no issues on this side. That's There's no issues regardless of what k is. This can represent the left side of the equation of a circle. The only thing we need is this thing has to be positive because radius must be positive. Okay, so we're now just solving the inequality k cubed plus 4k squared minus k minus 4 is strictly bigger than zero. How do we factorize this? Uh, or, well, solve this inequality, maybe we factorize it and we can kind of spot that k plus 4 is a factor just to make it a bit more clear. If I take out k squared from the first two terms, I get k squared times k plus 4. And I've got minus k plus 4, like so. And so this is going to be k plus 4 times k squared minus 1. It's positive. Uh, and obviously, that's going to be k plus 4 times k plus 1 times k minus 1. It is positive. And of course, we just sketch a quick uh, graph of this. It's got roots at minus 1, oops, minus 4, and 1. And it's a positive cubic, so it's going to look something like that. So either k is between minus 4 and minus 1, or k is bigger than 1. Um, so the answer here is going to be the first guy. Cool. Let's continue. Um, the largest value achieved by 3 cos squared x plus 2 sine x plus 1 equals which of these values? Uh, that's a pretty standard old form math question. So if you've ever looked at any of the older math questions, you see this type of problem. Uh, I've definitely seen it at least once in one of the older papers. What are we going to do? We're going to use sine squared plus cos squared is 1 to get this all in terms of sine x. So this is going to become 3 times 1 minus sine squared plus 2 sine x plus 1. Um, and if we just simplify, minus 3s squared um, plus 2s plus 4. And we're looking for the biggest value of this. So we're going to complete the square on this. You might think to differentiate, but uh, maybe I'll explain why in a second why we wouldn't want to differentiate this even if we thought of this as like, even if we differentiated this with respect to s. Um, so let's take out the minus three. So it's going to be s squared uh, minus two thirds s plus four. So that's going to be minus three s minus one third squared minus a ninth plus four. That's going to be minus three uh, s minus third squared uh, plus a third plus four, which is plus 13 over three. Okay, cool. And so what's the maximum value of this? Well, this guy here is guaranteed to be non-positive because it's neg negative number times a square. So the biggest this can be is zero, and that's going to occur when sine theta or sine x is a, is a third. And so the maximum value of this can be is 13 over three. Now, I said uh, I'd explain why you want to complete the square on this. Um, because imagine this was a slightly different result here, and we got s minus four thirds squared. Now, you might think, ah, the maximum will be when s is four thirds, and then you still get the same result. But in this case, no, because remember, s can only be between minus one and one. So we'd have to think a bit more about how we make what the actual maximum of this is. And so if this was minus four thirds, we'd have to think, OK, we want this to be, we're squaring it, and we want it to be as close to zero as possible. Sine is between minus one and one. So if I subtract four thirds from that, sine will be between minus two and a third and positive, uh, sorry, negative a third. So uh, what is that? Minus nine thirds. Um, no, that's not right. And not minus nine thirds. Uh, minus 10 thirds, sorry. Um, 
no, 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 that's not right either. So sine is between minus one and one, so that's minus three thirds, and then minus another four thirds is minus seven thirds. Um, and so then if you're squaring that, if you want if you want uh, s minus four thirds squared to be very, very small in size, you need s minus four thirds to be as close to zero. So you choose it to be minus one third. So in this case, the minimum, uh, sorry, the maximum value of this expression would be minus three times minus one third squared, which is a ninth plus 13 over three or whatever that is. Um, cool, awesome. Uh, let's continue. Okay, question 12. A line is tangent to the parabola y equals x squared at the point a comma a squared where a is positive. The area of the region bounded by the parabola, the tangent line, and the x-axis is which of these guys? So again, another kind of sketching problem. Uh, they do love these in the math. Let's sketch y equals x squared. Cool. So it's going to look something like that. And we've got a point a comma a squared, and we're told a is positive, so let's make it there. Uh, the area of the region bounded by the parabola, the tangent line, and the x-axis. So I presume we're talking about the tangent, yeah, at this point, is what? Okay, cool. So we probably want to work out the equation of this tangent line. So um, we know that the gradient of x squared is 2x, or the derivative of x squared is 2x. So the gradient of this line will be 2a. So it's going to be y equals 2ax plus some constant c. Let's shove in these points here. So a squared is 2a squared plus c. So c is minus a squared. So we get y equals 2ax minus a squared. OK, so we're looking for this area. Yep, so the bound by the parabola, tangent, and the x-axis. So we're just going to do the integral from 0 to a, because 0 is this point, a is this point, uh, where they kind of contact. And we're doing top curve minus bottom curve, so x squared minus uh, 2ax minus a squared dx. And what's this going to be? That's going to be one third x cubed minus two ax becomes minus ax squared uh, plus a squared x between a and zero. And I'll just bring this over here. Uh, that's going to be minus, uh, sorry, one third a cubed minus a cubed plus a cubed minus zero. So that's going to be a third a cubed. Oh, that's not one of the options. Hmm. Have I rushed this? I probably have. Uh, Okay, let's let's go through this a bit more slowly. So um x squared minus this guy is so x squared minus two ax. You integrate that, that's ax squared. It's gonna be plus a squared x. The third x cubed. Let me let me let me go through this. A line is tangent to the parabola y equals x squared. At this point, the area of the region bounded by the parabola, the tangent line, and the x-axis. Oh, I see what I've done wrong here. What I've calculated is this area here. That's I've calculated all of that. My bad. So well, at least now I can rectify that. <laughs> I just need to now subtract off this green triangle. I see. So I was rushing through this. That's my bad. So I need to take a third a cubed and subtract off, um, well, actually add on the area of this triangle because it's uh, treated that as a negative area. Um, what is the area of this triangle? Well, the, uh, we know that this distance here, we know the y-intercept is minus a squared. And what's this point? Well, we can work it out by making y zero in this. And in doing so, you get x equals a squared over 2a, which is a over 2. And so the area of this green triangle is going to be a over 2 times a squared over 2, which is a cubed over 4. So I need to add that onto this guy um, because, again, this one third a cubed is, oh, no, sorry. No, no, no. I need to take it away because I did top curve minus bottom curve, which is the total area here. So, yeah, I'm doing a third a cubed minus a quarter a cubed. 
which is going to give me one twelfth h cubed. So that should be the answer there. Um, so yeah, so just to just to go over that, because I guess I kind of rushed it in the end, is what, what I'd done originally, this computation was calculating this total area. So even though one of the lines goes beneath the x-axis, because I'm doing top curve minus bottom curve, regardless of um, where those, where the, um, you know, whether the curves are above or below the x-axis, that's always going to give me the area. And I guess a way to convince yourself of that, so if I'm doing integral of top minus bottom, if one of these curves goes below the x-axis, well, what you can do is just translate both of them sufficiently high so that they're both above the x-axis. And how would you do that? You just add a constant to the top curve and also the same constant to the bottom. That's not going to change the area. But of course, then these constants would end up cancelling out when you do the integral. So it would still be the same value. Um, cool. So yeah, almost uh, almost made a mistake there. So if that if one of the options here was a cubed over three, I would have got this one wrong. Uh, let's continue. Question thirteen: Which of the following is equal to log base ten of what ten factorial? Yeah, I've definitely seen this problem before. Nice and straightforward. We're just gonna uh, break this down into prime factors. Um, so. Let's ask ourselves, okay, how many tens can we get from this? Or let's just write this out in, um, so 10 is two times five. So two, three, five, seven. Those are the primes between uh, one and 10. So let's ask ourselves, how many twos have we got? Uh, so we've got one from two, two from four, uh, one from six, three from eight, and then one from 10. So that's eight in total. How many threes do we have? Well, we have one in three, one in six, and two in nine, so that's four. How many fives do we have? Well, there's two, one in five, one in 10. How many sevens do we have? Just one. So if we take out maybe the five squared and two of the two squareds, that's going to give us a two. And then we're going to get uh, six lots of log base 10, two, plus four lots of log base 10, three, plus seven, um, one lot of log base 10 of seven. Um, so that is, oh, they've, they've used log base six here. That's annoying. Okay. Um, so let me take four of these guys, the two log base 10 of two and take four log base 10 of two and combine them over here to make six. I don't know why they've done that, but okay. So it's going to be this guy here. Um, that just checks out. Cool. Let's continue. Question 14. A cubic has equation y equals x cubed plus ax squared plus bx plus c, and it has turning points at 1, 2, and 3d for some value d. What is the value of d? Okay, cool. My first thought is let's just go diving in with these numbers here. So if I plug in 1, 2, I get 2 equals 1 plus a plus b plus c. If I, uh, well, I also know that it's a turning point at 1, 2. So when I take the derivative of this, 1, 2 will also be a solution. Um, so, uh, sorry, when I plug in x is 1 into the derivative, I'll get 0. So 3x squared is 3 times 1 squared plus 2a plus b. That there must be equal to 0. Okay, cool. Um, can I do anything with that? Maybe I can subtract 1 from the other to cancel out the b's. I'll get 1 equals, no, uh, let's go 2a plus b. Let's just make b the subject. So b equals minus 2a minus 3. So 2 equals 1 plus a minus 2a minus 3c. Um, so I've just substituted that into the first guy. Um, what can I do with this? 1 minus 3, that makes minus 2. Bring that to the other side, so I get 4 equals c minus a. Cool. What else do I know? I know that 3d is a turning point, so I know when I take the derivative and sub in 3, I get zero, so I'm going to get 3x squared, so that's going to be 3 times 3 squared is 27, plus three, uh, 2ax, so that's going to be 6a plus b. This guy here equals zero. Okay, cool. Uh, in fact, maybe I should just use these to get me what b and a are. So subbing this in here, 27 plus 6a uh, minus 2a minus 3 equals zero. Um, so that's going to give me 24 plus 4a equals zero, so a is minus six. a is minus six, so that gives me that b equals nine. So a is minus six, b is nine. What's c equal to? c is gonna be equal to four plus a, that's minus two. So my cubic is y equals x cubed plus, 
minus 6x squared plus 9x minus 2. And we know it has a turning point at 3d. Uh, well, I just need to plug in the 3 now and just see what the y value is. So I get y equals 27 minus 9 times 6 is 54 plus 9 times 2 is 27 minus 2. Those guys cancel that, so I should be left with minus 2, like so. Um, there's a high chance that I've made some sort of error in that. Um, so I would be tempted to go and check my work, but just for the sake of moving on, it's not so exciting. If I check, um, we'll continue. Um, yeah, let's just continue. But I would probably at this point maybe slow down and check. How am I doing for time? I've got 115 minutes left, so just under two hours. So I spent, what, half an hour, just over half an hour on this. Got to question 13 or 14 now. Let's have a look at this. The cubic has equation y equals x cubed plus ax squared. Oh, wait, I haven't changed the question. Whoops. Uh, question 15. Oh, I've seen this one before as well. Six vectors, v1 up to v6, are chosen to either be 1, 1, or 3, 2 with equal probability, with each choice made independently. The, the probability that the sum v1 plus v2 plus v3 plus v4 plus v5 plus v6 is equal to the vector 10, 8 is what? Uh, yeah, so I've seen either this question or a very similar one on a on a previous map paper. So we want to add six of these guys together. Um, and each, like, you know, you can think of it as flipping a coin and we either get one, one, or we get three, two. And we're supposed to result in 10, eight. Okay, so we're ending up with uh, eight on the bottom. And so that tells me I've got to have an even number of these guys uh, in order to make 10, eight. Uh, because if I had an odd number of these, this will always be even on the bottom. So um, when I add these up, so they wouldn't add up to eight on the bottom. So I need an even number of these. So what are the possibilities? Well, I either have zero, two, four, or six. If I have all six of them being one, one, it clearly won't be 10, eight. And clearly if I have none of them being one, one, all six of them would have to be three, two, and that wouldn't add up to 10, eight either. Okay, what if I have two of these guys? Well, that give me two, two, and then I'd have to have four of these guys, which would be 12, eight, which is too many. So I have to have four one ones, which would give me four, four, and then two of these guys, which would give me six, four, and that does make 10, eight. So the question is, well, in how many ways uh, can I choose the V1 to V6 so that four of them are one, one, and that uh, two of them are three, two? This is just a binomial distribution question now. Um, so just to be slightly formal, let X equal number of one, ones, um, so the, essentially the question is, what is the probability that x equals 4? And we can simply just do binomial stuff. So it's, uh, x is binomial, 6 comma a half. So it's 6 choose 4 times a half to the 4 times a half squared. Uh, and so this is going to be 6 choose 4, which is 6 times 5 over 2, uh, which is 15. So it's going to be 15 over 2 to the 6, which is 15 over 64. So that's our answer. Cool. Let's continue. Yeah, it's, uh, not 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 a huge fan that they've got lots of repeated questions here. I feel certainly if they're going to change the format of the map, they should definitely include new questions. Like uh, that's the least you can do for new students, uh, especially when students are nervous taking this new format exam. Anyway, let's have a look at sixteen here. The tangent to the curve y equals x cubed minus three x at the point a comma a cubed minus three a also passes through two zero for precisely which values of A. Okay, cool. So my first thought is maybe sketch this graph um, and then think about um, various values of A. So uh, X cubed minus three X, uh, or maybe I wanna do a bit of calculus on this. So let's, let's work out the equation of the tangent, just cause I think if I did sketch this, I'd have to think about various cases for A. If A is zero, if A is positive, is negative, maybe something like that. So let me try it first with a bit of algebra and then maybe I can resort to using a graph later. Um, so let's just find the tangent here. So it's going to be 3x squared minus 3 is dy dx. And so if we sub in a, we're going to get that the gradient of the tangent is 3a squared minus 3. And we know it passes through this, so we can say y equals 3a squared minus 3x plus c. And sub in, subbing in this, we get a cubed minus 3a equals 3a squared minus 3 times a plus c. That's going to be 3a cubed minus 3a. Those cancel on both sides. And so we get that c is minus 2a cubed. Cool. 
So the equation of our tangent is going to be y equals um, 3a squared minus 3x plus or c, which is minus 2a cubed. Cool. That's the equation of our tangent, and we want to know when it passes through to zero. So I think we can just do this purely algebraically, just sub in to zero. So we're going to get zero is two lots of 3a squared minus 3 minus 2a cubed. And now we're asked, essentially, we boiled this down to asking how many solutions are there to this cubic equation. Let's bring everything on one side. So we get 2a cubed um, minus 6a squared plus 6 equals zero, divide by 2. Let me bring this up here. a cubed minus 3a squared plus 3 is zero. Um, this is a cubic, so we know it's going to have at least one solution. And it's definitely not going to have infinitely many solutions. So we've narrowed it down to three options. Um, how can we work out how many solutions this has? Well, we're going to use a little bit of graph sketching here. So I'm just going to clear the screen, but we're just going to remember this cubic here. a cubed minus 3a squared plus 3. So what we're going to do is sketch a picture here. So what I'm going to do is first sketch the picture of the graph uh, f of x. And I'm going to say f of x, or yeah, it's going to be x cubed minus 3x squared. Um, so, so essentially just without the 3 here. What does this look like? Well, it has a root, double root at the origin and one at 3. And it's a positive cubic, so it's going to look something like that. OK, cool. And now we're adding three to this. So if we think about this guy, that's, if I think about the sketch of that graph, it's just this, but vertically translated uh, by three. So it could look something like that. And the question is how many roots does it have? And as I've drawn it, it looks like it's three, but obviously I don't really know what this distance is just yet, because if that's only like one, then when I translate it by three units, the new graph will look something like this, and there'll only be one solution here. So what I need to do is work out what this distance here is. And to do that, we can just use calculus. So we take the derivative of f, which is 3x squared minus 6x, and set it equal to 0, and divide by 3, as uh, so we get x squared minus 2x. So x, x minus 2 is 0. So we know that that has x coordinate 2. Let's just work out the y value. It's going to be 2 cubed minus 3 times 2 squared, so 8 minus 12. So that's going to be minus, or minus 4 there. So if I add three to it, this guy here is still going to remain below the uh, x-axis. And so it's going to look something like that when I add three. And so we can see there's going to be three solutions there. Uh, so the answer here is that guy. So three values of A solve this thing here. And now you may ask, well, um, how do I know to do this? Well, once you get to this stage here of getting this, how did I know to sketch it? Well, this question is a question where it's how many values of A are there, not what are the values of A. So whenever you get a question where it's like, how many solutions are there to an equation, that's almost certainly a giveaway that you want to sketch the graph. So that's a really, really useful trick. You want to sketch the graph of a function if the question says how many uh, solutions are there or anything like that. Awesome. Cool. Let's continue. Next question. Question 17. Ah, again, seen this question before. Um, the sum of sine squared one degree plus sine squared two degrees and so on up to sine squared 90 equals what? I think this was either on the mat or maybe on one of the TMUA questions, um, but I've definitely seen this before. Um, obviously, they're not expecting us to know um, the, the values of these individually, apart from maybe one or two or a few of these. Um, what's the trick? We're going to pair up terms here. So sine squared 89, we're going to pair with sine squared 1. And it turns out that those two terms, I don't know what they are individually, but they add up to 1. How do I know that? Let's just draw a quick triangle. If I have an angle x here, and I call this ABC, this is a right angle triangle, I know that sine of x is b over c. But this angle here is just going to be 90 minus x. And I can say that sine or... Uh, sine of uh, 90 minus x is going to be a over c opposite over, j, uh, over hypotenuse. But that's also just going to be the same as cos of x. So we get this nice identity here that sine of 90 minus x is the same as cos of x. So sine of 89 is going to be the same as cos of 1. And so this is just going to be sine squared 1 plus cos squared 1, which will be 1. 
And so we can do the same thing with sine squared 2 and sine squared 88 and so on, kind of pair these terms going inwards and inwards until 40, sine squared 44 and sine squared 46. So this thing here is going to equal, uh, well, if I go up to 44, that's going to be 44 terms plus sine squared of 45 plus sine squared of 90. Sine squared of 90 is 1. Sine of 45 is 1 over root 2. So squaring that gives me a half. So this is going to be 45.5. So that would be our answer. Sweet. Let's continue. Question 18. Which of the following graphs shows y equals log base 2 of 9 minus 8 sine x minus 6 cos squared x for x between 0 and 360? Again, I'm pretty sure I've seen a similar question to this before. We've got a bunch of options here. Uh, if you've watched my channel before, you'll know one of my favorite things to do with these sorts of problems is just find the intercepts first. It's a really easy way to eliminate options. So let's do that. Let's sub in x is 0. So when x is 0, what do we get? We get y is log base 2 of 9 minus 6, which is log base 2 of 3. I, we don't know what that is, but it's going to be a positive number. So I know the y-intercept is positive. So the first few options check out. Okay, it doesn't eliminate anything. No problem at all. And maybe we can think about the x-intercepts as well. When does this cross the x-axis, if at all? Well, we can do that by making this thing here 1. So we'd have uh, 9 minus 8 sine x minus 6 cos squared x is 1. And so if we bring everything to one side, 6 cos squared x uh, plus 8 sine x minus 8 is 0. Uh, divide by 2. Uh, so we're going to get 3 cos squared x, which is 1 minus sine squared plus 4 sine minus 4 is 0. And so simplifying this, minus 3s squared uh, plus 4s uh, minus 1 equals 0. And now you could think about factorizing this. I can clearly see s is 1 is a solution. So I can factor out s minus 1. Um, and then I get minus 3s plus 1. So my solutions, the times when it's going to hit the x-axis are when sine x equals 1 and when sine x equals 1 third. Okay, so I know that sine x equals 1 at 90 degrees, uh, so it's going to hit roughly a quarter of the way from 360, so it's not going to be this guy, not going to be this guy. Um, let me scroll down. Uh, um, and then these guys are maybe up for grabs still. I can't really eliminate much there. But when it also hits when sine x equals one third, when does sine x equal one third? Well, it's somewhere here. We've got two solutions be before 180 degrees. So therefore, we know that we're going to have three roots between zero and 180 and no other roots. So it can't be this guy either. And so now we're left with these two potential options. Uh, it's one of these guys. Um, and so now I'm looking at these two options. They look awfully similar. One big difference, though, is that option, this option here goes below the x-axis. So I need to ask myself, does this graph go below the x-axis? So let's, let's think about that. Let's go back to the function. In order for this to go below the x-axis, we require 9 minus 8 sine x minus 6 cos squared x to be less than 1 for, for certain values. And you can kind of tell that it's going to be less than 1 for some values just by changing all the work we did here making all of these equals twos, uh, making them less than. So that becomes less than, but then we brought everything to that side. So it's bigger than, bigger than, bigger than, bigger than zero. And so this guy here just looks like, like this. So as long as sine x can be some value between a third and one, absolutely this thing can be negative. So this thing for sure can be negative. And so the answer is C or this, this guy here. This one. Awesome. Cool. Let's continue. Question 19. A sequence A naught uh, has A naught 3, and then for n at least 1, the sequence satisfies A n equals 8 A n minus 1 to the 4. The value of A 10 is which of these five options? OK, and um, one of my best pieces of advice for sequence questions is just write out the first few terms until maybe you spot some sort of pattern. So A0 is 3. A1 is going to be 8 times 3 to the 4. OK, cool. We could work that out, but I don't think we'll need to because all of these options are in powers. What would A2 be? That's going to be 8 times 8 times 3 to the 4 to the 4, which is going to be 8 
to the 1 times a to the 4, so a to the 5 times 3 to the 16. Okay, what's a3 going to be? Well, that's going to be uh, 8 times 8 to the 5, 3 to the 16 to the 4, which is going to be 8 to the 21 times 3 to the 64. Okay, cool. So I can see, firstly, the answer is clearly going to have, we're looking for a10, the 10th term. It's clearly going to be 8 to the power of something times 3 to the power of something. But of course, 8 to the power of something can be written as 2 to the power of something. Um, so my answer is going to have to involve um, something like that. So it's definitely not going to be um, this guy, because that doesn't have any powers of 2 on the top, nor does this guy. It doesn't have any powers of 3. Now it's going to be one of these guys here. Now I just have to be a bit careful and maybe think about each of these terms. So let's focus on the powers of 3. Hopefully it's clear to see the a n is going to be something times 3 to the power of 4 to the power of n. So here, a naught had 3 to the power of 1, which is the same as 3 to the power of 4 to the power of 0. This guy here has 3 to the 4, which is 3 to the 4 to the 1. This guy has 3 to the 16, which is 3 to the 4 to the 2, and so on. OK, what about the, the 8 term? Well, it's going to be 8 to the power of um, so we went from 1 to 5 to 21, and each time we were kind of uh, raising the previous one to the power of 4, or like timesing it by 4 and then adding 1. So it's kind of like a, a quadratic sequence, um, if you like. Um, I'm actually just thinking before I work out that maybe I don't need to, because I know that this is just going to be 2 to the power of something. Um, we can focus on the 3 to the 4 to the n. So when n is 10, this will be 3 to the 4 to the 10, or 3 to the 2 to the 20. Um, so the answer's got to have a 3 to the 2 to the 20 n. So it can't be this guy, because this has 3 to the 2 to the 20 on the top, then divided by 3. So it can't be that. And uh, So it's left between one of these guys. So now I do need to work out the power of 2. Um, okay, so here we had two, uh, 8, 8 to the 5, uh, 8 to the 21. Wow, okay. Wow, this is an interesting one. I don't even need to work out what it is specifically. If we look at the power of, oh, wait, no. Never mind, I was going to say something that was, that was wrong. Um, so... Uh, what are we doing? So, so if we just focus on the powers of eight here, so here it was, so it went from, it was one here, then it was five, or oh, no, I'm going to write it as one plus four, then this one was one plus five times four, or in fact, I'll write it as one plus one plus four times four, ah, and so you, you can see that that's going to be one plus four plus four squared, the next one will be one plus four plus four squared plus four cubed. So just to verify that, that'll be A4, which is gonna be eight times eight to the 21 times three to the 64 to the power of four, which is gonna be eight to the 17. Um, wait, no, that's supposed to be 21 there. So eight to the 84 plus one to 85 times three to the 64 times four, which is 256. Anyway, that will be 85, which is 1 plus 4 plus 4 squared plus 4 cubed. Okay, cool. So we know that then the power of uh, 2 here is for 2 to the 10, uh, a 10 is going to be 1 plus 4 squared plus 4 cubed all the way up to 4 to the 9, because we're going to 1 less, because a 3 went to 4 squared. This is just a geometric uh, sum. Um, we can work this out. So the first term is a. The common ratio here is 4 and the number of terms is 10, so it's going to be a times uh, 1 minus r to the 10, all over 1 minus r. So it's going to be 1 to the, uh, 4 to the 10 minus 1, all over 3, like so. Um, and so that's going to be the, what's that going to be? That's going to be the power of 8. So that means that the power of 2 because remember, eight is two cubed, is going to be two. It's going to be three times it. So four to the ten minus one, which is going to be two to the twenty minus one, 
And so we must have two to the 20 as well. As a, This is a power of two. So it's going to be this guy because we've got divided by two on the bottom to account for that. So it's three times two to the 20 and then two times uh, two to the 20. And now I've just realized I didn't need to do all of that because this is not three to the power of two to the power of 20. This is nine to the power of two to the power of 20. That's frustrating. Uh, anyway, the answer is this guy. Six times six to the power of two to the 20 divided by two. Oh, a lot of annoying number calculating crunching there. Um, but yeah, pretty standard math question. Let's continue. If the expression x plus 1 plus 1 over x to the 4 is fully expanded term by term and like terms are collected together, there is one term which is independent of x. The value of this term is 19, 81, 14, 51, or 10. Okay, so we're essentially being asked what's the constant term in this. So let's write this out. x plus 1 plus 1 over x. x plus 1 plus 1 over x x plus 1 plus 1 over x, x plus 1 plus 1 over x. Okay, what we're going to ask ourselves is how can we get a constant term if we expand all this? We're choosing one term from each bracket. So one way we can do it is by choosing the 1 from each bracket. That's pretty self-explanatory. So just doing 1 times 1 times 1 times 1. Okay, how else could we do it? Well, we can get x from two brackets and then 1 over x from the other two brackets. So that would be x squared times one over x squared. How else can we do it? Well, we could take x from one bracket, one over x from another bracket, and then one from the other two brackets. So x times one over x times one squared. And that should hopefully be clear that those are the only ways that you can really do this. Okay, how many ways can we choose one from each bracket? Well, there's only one way to do that, uh, just by choosing one from each bracket. How many ways are there to choose x from two brackets and one over x from two brackets. Well, that's going to be precisely four choose two, because you have four brackets to start with, and you need to choose two of them to pick the x from. Once you've picked the two which have the x in, let's say this guy and this guy, you're forced to take one over x from those two brackets. So you're going to get four choose two ways of doing that. Four choose two is four times three divided by two, which is six. Okay, and what about this? x times 1 over x times 1 squared. How many ways are there of uh, doing that? Well, firstly, you've got to choose two brackets to take the 1 from. Uh, let's say it's these last two brackets here. You've chosen those two, so that's going to give you 4 choose 2. But then you still have two brackets left, and you can either go x, 1 over x, or 1 over x, x. So you have two ways um, of doing this, or two factorial ways. Okay, and what does this give you? Well, this gives you 4 times 3 over 2 times 2, which is going to be 12. Okay, so then the, the you're just going to add these up then. The 12 plus 6 plus 1 gives you 19, and that would be your answer. Cool. Let, let's continue. Question 21. So we've only got five more questions of the multiple choice left, and we've got 93 minutes remaining. So... What is this, two and a half hours? That's 150 minutes. So it's went just around an hour on these questions so far. The following five graphs are in some order plots of y equals f of x, g of x, and h of x, and y equals df of dx and dg of dx. Uh, I think I've seen th this problem or a similar problem before. Um, that is three unknown functions and the derivatives of the first two of those functions. Which graph is the plot of h of x? Okay, so we've got f, g, h, df dx and dg dx. This is really annoyingly printed that it's like it's not all in one. I can't see it all in one go. Um, I'm not sure how I'm gonna how I'm gonna do this, but okay. Let, let, let's just look through the options here. We've got one which looks like a negative cubic. This guy looks like a positive quadratic quadratic. This looks like a negative quartic. This looks like a positive cubic. This looks like a negative cubic. Okay, cool. Uh, and we want to know which one is h. So h is one function, and we've got two functions and the two derivatives. Okay, so if we go by the metric that we've got these as quartics and cubics and quadratics, hopefully it's clear that this guy, this is a quartic, and so it must be either f of x or g of x. It doesn't really matter which one. So let's call this a, b, c, d, e. We're going to say c is f of x, which is a negative quartic. And so then f prime of x will be a negative cubic, 
So it could be option A, um, or it could be option E. So we'll just say that's either A or E for the time being. Okay, and we can also do something similar with the with the quadratic here and go, well, this is a quadratic, so we know it's got to be the derivative of one of these other guys. So that's going to be either df dx or dg dx. Well, it certainly can't be df dx because we know f is a is a is a quartic. Um, so this is a quartic. It's a negative cubic. So we can say dg dx is going to be option B, the positive quadratic. So what's g of x going to be? Well, that's going to be a positive cubic, and thankfully there's only one of those. It's going to be d. Okay, so we know that either the options are either A or E. One of them is going to be F prime of X and the other one's going to be H of X. So maybe we need to do a bit more inspection as to maybe where these roots occur. So if we look at F of X, this negative quartic, we can see it's got turning points, roughly speaking, at minus two and two, give or take. And so that means that the derivative of F of X, which is the negative cubic, uh, which is either A or E, must have roots at minus two or two. So A has roots, well, oh, wait, not A or E, wait. Uh, sorry, A has roots roughly near minus 2 and 2. And we can see that this option E has no roots near minus 2 and 2. So that means that A must be F prime of X, leaving E to be H of X. Um, now, you may ask, well, what if these aren't polynomials? What if these aren't actually cubics, quartics, um, things like that? Well, you can still kind of apply the same idea, just more by thinking of turning points. So a turning point on one graph corresponds to a root on the other. So like this graph here, if it's not a quartic, whatever it is, it has three turning points. And so its derivative must have three roots. So you can look at the graphs which have three roots. Anyway, this would be our answer for this guy. Let's continue. Question 22. In the range x between minus 90 and 90, how many values of x are there which uh, for which this guy uh, equals tan x, this infinite sum. Again, seen this one before. Um, annoyingly, though, I imagine in the actual mat test, if you're if you're sitting the mat, we'll have no questions that you've seen before. Maybe same techniques, hopefully. And that's why we do these tests to help you prepare. Um, but uh, yeah, I can't imagine they'll, they'll reprint the exact same question verbatim from a previous paper. Anyway, how many values of x are there for which this sum to infinity equals tan x? Um, okay, so... Um, just a geometric sum. Uh, what can we say about it? It's an infinite sum, so we can just use the a over 1 minus r formula. So a is 1 over tan x, r is 1 over tan x. So if we simplify that, that's going to be 1 minus over tan x minus 1. Um, and we want this to equal tan x, like so. So if we cross multiply, we get tan squared x minus tan x uh, minus 1 equals 0. And we want to know for how many values of x are there which this uh, satisfies. So we need, uh, well, firstly, there are two solutions here. What are they going to be? Let's just I know, complete the square. So you're going to get t minus a half squared equals 5 over 4. So if I bring this up here, we get t minus a half is plus minus root 5 over 2. So t is 1 plus or minus root 5 over 2. So we get two possible values of tan x. Um, and if we think about the sketch of a graph of tan, oh gosh, it's going to look something like this. And um, 1 plus root 5 over 2 is somewhere up here. 1 plus root 5, root 5 is slightly bigger than 2, divided by 2 gives you something slightly bigger than 1.5. And tan uh, 1 minus root 5 over 2, um, that's going to be uh, 1 minus 2, roughly. So about minus a half, give or take. Um, so somewhere there uh, are going to be your solutions. Okay, however, we've got to be careful. Remember, for this formula here to apply, a over 1 minus r, you need to ensure that the ratio is uh, between minus 1 and 1. So the ratio here is 1 over tan x, so we need to check that 1 over tan x is between minus 1 and 1. But for these two values, tan x, uh, in the 1.5 case, 1 over tan x will be between minus 1 and 1. It'll be roughly 2 thirds. However, uh, if we look at the minus a half case, that will be uh, one over that will be minus two. So this guy won't converge. So the answer here is one. Cool. Um, let's continue. 
Question 23. Consider a square with side lengths 2 and center 0, 0, and a circle with radius r and center 0, 0. Let A of r be the region inside the circle but outside the square, and B of r be the region inside the square but outside the circle. Which of the following is a sketch of AR plus BR? Interesting. This I've not seen before. And we've got a few different graphs here. Okay, let's sketch a picture first. That seems pretty, pretty straightforward. Let's, uh, so we've got a square of side length two. Um, so there's our square. And we've also, and the center is zero, zero. So that there is gonna be one. And we've got a circle with radius R and center zero, zero. So circle radius R. Center zero zero. Okay. So that distance there is one. And this has this radius r. Okay. And so A of R is the region inside the circle but outside the square. So at the moment, the way I've drawn it, A of R is nothing. Um, so if R is less than one, we can see that or less than or equal to one, we can see that the circle is going to be entirely in the square. So A of R is going to be zero. Okay, and what if B of R is the area of the region that is inside the square but outside the circle? So this guy here. Okay, so if R is less than one, we can say that B of R is just going to be the area of the square minus the area of the circle, which is going to be four minus pi R squared. Okay, cool. So we want to know what's the value of A R plus B R. Okay, well with this, we can explicitly work out what this is going to be for r less than or equal to one, it's gonna be these two guys added together, which is four minus pi r squared. What does four minus pi r squared look like? Well, it's a negative quadratic with y intercept of four. So we, we know that it's gonna start off looking like this. So we can eliminate any options that don't look like that. So the first guy goes away and that's about it. Uh, yeah, that's about it. Annoyingly, but that's fine. Okay, cool. So. What I notice is amongst the four remaining options is they all seem to kind of dip down and then bounce off the x-axis, or maybe just uh, in the cases of B and E, they slightly miss the x-axis, but they kind of bounce back up, which uh, I guess kind of makes sense, right? Because once the circle expands sufficiently large, the area between the circle and the square, the square is fixed, that's going to keep growing off to infinity. Okay. But two of these options suggest that AR plus BR could be zero, and the other two don't. So that's probably what I'm going to investigate next, um, because that will help me eliminate two options. So can AR plus BR be zero? OK, so I've, I've considered what happens when R is less than or equal to one. Let's now draw what happens when R is at least one uh, or bigger than one. So I'm going to use a different color as well. So if I have a circle like so, make the centers align, something like that, broadly speaking. So there's the center of the square and the circle. And so AR again is the region inside the circle, but outside the square. So now this is when R is bigger than root two, I guess I should say, because that distance there from the center to the corner would be root two. That's when the circle kind of fully goes outside the square. So if R is at least root two, I can say that A of R equals, um, it's gonna equal, it's gonna equal just pi R squared minus four, and B of R is gonna be the bit, is gonna be zero. Yeah, inside the square and outside the circle. So B of R will be zero. So you're gonna get pi R squared minus four when R is at least root two. So it's gonna look quite quadratic-y. Um, so maybe not this guy, um, but that's not super useful. I mean, that could plausibly be a quadratic. I'm just going to not really use that at the moment. I think what I need to do is think about what happens when R is between one and root two. So let me draw another circle, um, maybe using a third color. Let's go for green. So when it's kind of half in, half out, um, so maybe something a bit smaller something like this. Okay, cool. So we've got a, a circle here, center zero, zero. Now the radius is somewhere between one and two. 
And now we may have to do some actual uh, geometry, some, some calculation to get this. So the radius of this circle is R. Okay, so what's A of R here? So A of R was, what was A of R? Is that inside the circle? Inside the circle, but outside the square. Okay, so it's going to be this area here. Okay, by symmetry, it's just going to be four lots of this area. How do I work out this area? Well, uh, is it going to be pretty to do this? I don't think so. Um, hmm. It's going to be... So if I call that angle there theta, it's going to be a half r squared theta minus a half r squared sine theta, um, which is going to be a half r squared theta minus sine theta. Um, I'm just trying to think what happens to theta. So theta is going to initially be zero degrees. So like when the circle, when I increase r just slightly bigger than one, the circle will look something like this. And this angle theta will be starting from zero, very, very acute angle. And then what's the biggest that uh, theta can be? Well, it's going to be over here when it's 90 degrees. Okay, cool. Um, and so that's going to give me that area. And so now I just multiply that by four. So A of R, depending on what theta is, I can maybe potentially try and work out what theta is in terms of R, but I'm not going to bother. Um, it's going to be two R squared theta minus sine theta. So in my head, I'm just thinking, okay, R is going from one to root two. And as R goes from one to root two, theta goes from zero to 90 degrees. Okay, cool. So that's what A of R is. Um, what about B of R? So B of R is inside the square, but outside the circle. So that's going to be these pesky little cornery bits here. How can I work out the area of those? Um, ah, well, this is interesting. I can take this angle here. So this here is going to be 90 minus theta um, just by symmetry. That's got to be 90 minus theta. So this kind of small slither here is going to be a half r squared 90 minus theta minus a half r squared sine of 90 minus theta, uh, which is going to be a half r squared 90 minus theta minus sine of 90 minus theta, or I'll just put minus cos theta, like so. And so the area of AR plus BR, so if I multiply that by four, it gives me 2R squared theta, so 90 minus theta. Uh, I probably shouldn't use 90 here. I should use, uh, yeah, this is supposed to be in radians, sorry. Uh, so pi over 2 minus theta plus cos theta. And so if I add these two guys up, what do I get? Well, the thetas quite nicely cancel, and I'm running out of space here, but I'm going to get uh, 2R squared times pi over 2 plus cos theta minus sine theta. So this is AR plus B of R. Okay, so I know that for R between 1 and root 2, my graph looks something like this. So it's going to be 2R squared times this kind of scale factor, which annoyingly does depend on R because it's got a theta on there and theta depends on R. Okay, so... What would this look like? I don't know if this is the best way to approach this, but uh, let's, let's continue regardless. So we know it's not the first option. Ah, I guess maybe one thing we can address is, does this guy here ever hit the x-axis? And I think the answer is no, because, um, yeah, so cos theta minus sine theta, if you've seen maybe second year A-level maths, you'll know that the maximum value that can be is root two, or the minimum value that can be is root two. Root two is roughly 1.4, uh, roughly speaking, 1.4. Pi over two is roughly 1.5. So the smallest that this could possibly be is roughly 1.5 minus 1.4, which is 0 0.1, which is strictly positive. And so therefore, AR plus BR will always be positive. So that eliminates this guy and this guy. So it's either B or E. At this stage, it's getting quite messy. Apologies for that. Um, what are the differences? Um, what are the differences? Uh, or maybe the values that when R is two, maybe I should have looked at that. So when R is two, this guy says that A of R plus B of R is eight. This guy says that, uh, sorry, this guy says that A of R plus B of R is less than four. 
So I think that's what I'm going to do now is look at what what happens when R is two and just manually compute some stuff there. So in fact, let me let me do that. I'm going to clear the screen um, and look at what happens when R is two. So we know it's either A, sorry, B or B or E. Let me make a note of that before I forget. Um, so let's draw a square. And now we're going to have the circle having radius two. So in fact, maybe I'll make the square a bit smaller. Circle's going to have radius two, so much, much bigger than the square. And um, yeah, so now we're just going to manually compute these things. So what would A of R be? That's inside the circle, but outside the square. So that's this area. So that's going to be, so when R equals two, we're going to get pi R squared minus four, which is going to be four pi minus four. Uh, yeah, four pi minus four for A of R, that is. And what about B of R? That's going to be inside the square, but outside the circles. So that's going to be zero. Um, and so therefore A of R plus B of R is four pi minus four, uh, which is like four times pi minus one. Pi is roughly three. Pi minus one is roughly two. So four times two is eight. So the answer therefore must be E, because when R is two, the y value is roughly eight. Hmm, an interesting question. Uh, I've not seen this one before. Uh, I'm not sure if I like it or not. Like uh, this last part here doesn't seem super satisfactory in the sense that we had to kind of just use the R value here. Maybe there's a better way of doing this. I'm not too sure. Um, but it looks like these graphs are very similar. They kind of bounce up. They both have a turning point. I presume that's root two. Um, yeah, it's uh, an interesting one. But yeah, this one definitely would have been one that students would have spent a bit more time on on average compared to the other multiple choice questions. Uh, let's oh, oopsie daisy. Let's have a look at the next one. Sequence is defined by a naught is two, and then for n at least one, uh, a n is one more than the product of the pre of all previous terms. So a one is three, and a two is seven, for example. Ah, I see, I see. Okay, so a naught is two. And then a1, the next term, is the product of all the previous terms plus 1. So the product of the previous terms, there's only one term, so 2, add 1 is 3. a2, you multiply all the previous terms, so 2 times 3 is 6, add 1 is 7. a3 would be 7 times 3 times 2, which is 42, plus 1 is 43, and so on. So notice, again, a sequence problem, I'm automatically just trying to find the first few terms. What's this question asking? It's saying, what is the formula for an? Is it, which of these guys is it? Okay. Interesting. So, um, it's very interesting. Okay. I think I know how to answer this. Um, so if you were stuck on this, I think one thing you could do, do, just do is manually work out the first few terms here and just test these out. Um, so plugging in zero, checking you get two. I think that will probably be the case for lots of these. Or oh, if I, it says for n at least one. So you'd have to start with one or whatever, but yeah. Um, how can you work this out? Well, I think the way to do it is actually think about how we're defining each term. So a1 is just a0 plus 1. a2 is a1 times a0 plus 1. But a1, remember, was a0 plus 1. So this is going to end up being a0 squared plus a0 plus 1. How about this guy? This is going to be a2 times a1 times a0 plus 1. But a2 is this guy, so a0 squared plus a0 plus 1 times a1, which is a0 plus 1 times a0 plus 1. Uh, well, actually, maybe this is a bit messier than I would have anticipated. And that's going to be a0 cubed plus 2a0 squared plus 2a0 plus 1 times a0 plus 1, which is a0 to the 4, plus 2a0 cubed, plus 2a0 squared, plus a0 plus 1. Okay, maybe not as exciting as I thought. Uh, hmm. Okay, I think I know how you did it now. <laughs> so I thought it would be this, and you can define everything then nicely in terms of a0. That's not the case, but you can define everything nicely in terms of the previous term. So like a recursive sequence, so something a bit like what we've got going on in these options here. 
how do you get from A3 to A2? So A3, what did we do? We took the number A2, A1 and A3, and multiplied them together. But remember, these two multiplied together gives us precisely one less than A2. So instead of thinking of A3 as A2, A1, A0 plus 1, let's think of these guys as giving us A2 and then A2 minus 1. So 3 times 2 is 7 minus 1. And hopefully you can see that this, this formula will be true. I've just There's nothing special about 3, 2, 1, and 0 here. You can replace this with any numbers. And so we're going to get um, this here is our formula, option B. Cool. Moving on to the final multiple choice question, we've got 70 minutes remaining. So I've spent about 80 minutes so far. Four distinct real numbers, A, B, C, and D, are used to define four points. A, capital A, capital B, capital C, capital D. The quadrilateral A, B, C, D has all four sides the same length, if and only if. Which of these is true? This question uh, rings a bell. Um, I'm not sure from where, um, but okay. We want all four sides to have the same length. Not super exciting. Let's just work out the length of, let's say, AB. Um, so that's going to be just using the form. In fact, I'll do AB squared, make my life a bit easier. It's going to be C minus A squared, sorry, C minus B squared plus B minus A squared. What about uh, BC squared using Pythagoras? It's going to be D minus C squared plus C minus B squared. CD squared is going to be A minus D squared plus D minus C squared. And DA squared is going to be B minus A squared uh, plus D minus A squared or A minus D squared. doesn't really matter. Okay, cool. So now what we want to do is work out, well, when are these guys all equal to each other? Um, okay. One thing that's springing to mind is that I know that D minus A squared is the same as A minus D squared. Um, and... So if I were to subtract those two things from each other, so if I did CD squared minus DA squared, if those are the same length, that would obviously be zero, but these guys would cancel out and I'd get D minus C squared minus B minus A squared. And you can kind of do a similar thing up here by canceling these guys and doing BC squared minus AB squared, like so. So certainly, if we want all of these, uh, if we want them to have the same length, we certainly need this to be true. So CD squared minus DA squared to be equal to BC squared minus AB squared. I actually don't think that's super um, useful here. Um, maybe I thought it was. Let me, does that do anything? I don't think it's done anything useful. Uh, oh, wait, wait, wait. Oh, hold on a minute. Uh, how do I... Un oh, okay. I'll just, let me just rewrite it again. So CD squared minus DA squared. So the CD squared... Oh, I'm getting a call. I'm getting a spam call. Let me ignore that. So CD squared minus DA squared is going to be uh, DC squared minus B minus A squared. And we want that to be zero. And so certainly we need... Um, where is it? So this guy needs to be true. However, that doesn't necessarily mean option A is correct, because that, for example, could be um, just a sufficient condition. So what we've shown is that this is sufficient for, no, sorry, if all the side lengths are the same, then that implies this is true. So this is a necessary condition, sorry, for all the side lengths to be the same. But I can kind of maybe repeat this argument with another rotation of letters. Um, so if I um, stare at this a bit longer, maybe I'll spot it. So, ah, okay, so these guys, I can cancel the C minus D squareds from and say that B squared minus C D squared must be zero. And so these two must be the same. So A minus D squared must be the same as B minus C squared, which is kind of that guy. And now we go, hold on a second. We need both of these things to be true. Okay, how can that be? Hmm. And maybe you could look at another rotation of letters, but I think this might be enough. So we certainly need both of these conditions to kind of be true, at least, at the very least. Um, 
what can we do with that? Maybe we can, um, maybe we can do something with that. Uh, yes, I think we can. So here, let's subtract. So we want these both we have established have to be true for there to be any hope of uh, these guys being the same length. So if I just make some space, um, just put it here at the bottom, let's uh, subtract those guys. And I'm going to use a difference of two squares to help me. If I do the left side, I'm going to get a minus b squared minus a minus d squared. So if I do difference of two squares, that's going to be d minus a multiplied by 2a minus b minus d. Um, sorry, not d minus a, d minus b. Um, yeah, and then equals on the right hand side doing the same thing, so subtracting one from the other. So, um, oh, actually, no, wait a minute. Oh, I'm, I'm just going to write this as c minus b squared just to make it a bit easier. Uh, so, if I do difference of two squares, so that's going to be uh, so b minus d multiplied by um. Uh, 2c minus b minus d like so and now what's quite nice is we've got a b minus d factor on both sides or maybe they'll put minus sign here whatever and make this d minus b doesn't really matter and so i'm really tempted to cancel them obviously b and d could be the same but i just need to be mindful of that for the time being let's assume they're not and now i'm going to get rid of them on both sides and put a minus sign here and so what do I get then? I get the 2a minus b minus d equals minus 2c plus b plus d. And bringing everything on one side gives me, uh, get, basically is going to give me this equation here. Because I'm going to get 2a plus 2c and minus 2b minus 2d equals 0. And dividing by 2 gives me 0. So that's potentially the case. But that's obviously under the assumption that b minus d is not 0. What happens if b minus d is zero? Well, that means that b and d are the same. And if b and d are the same, well, we can kind of then prove that a and c must be the same. And you get this equation here, I believe. Um, so if let's say b and d are the same, I'm going to actually get rid of this. We're just going to remember that no matter what, we know that both of these needs to be true. Um, so if b and d are the same, so if b and d are the same, we get a minus b squared equals c minus b squared, bringing uh, everything onto one side, a minus b squared minus c minus b squared is zero. And so we're going to get a minus b, or in fact, using difference of two squares, so I'm going to get a minus c um, plus a plus c minus 2b, so times a plus c minus 2b equals zero. Um, and so we have that. And also, if we do something similar here, we can get uh, a minus d. Oh, no, so that's going to be the same equation. Um, so we either have a minus c is 0, which is great, and we'll get something like that. Or we have a plus c minus 2b is 0, which is also going to be the same as that, because we're assuming b is d. So regardless of this, we need a minus b plus c minus d to be 0. Um, and you can then actually check that that, that does work. Um, but yeah, so, so the answer here is going to be the final option. Um, yeah, like so. Uh, a fiddly one. Um, maybe some nice spots. But I'm pretty sure I've seen that problem maybe in a previous map before. I'm not too sure. Cool. Let's have a look at the long questions. My battery may run out soon, so hopefully I can do them in time. We've got 62 minutes left, so doing okay for time. Let's see. How is this formatted? Okay. Okay, what so Alice, Bob, and Charlie? Oh, the formatting is horrible. I don't know if that's not just on my computer or if that's going to be a thing for other students. Anyway, let's have a look. Alice, Bob, and Charlie are well known expert logicians. They always tell the truth. In each of the scenarios below, Charlie writes a whole number on Alice and Bob's forehead. The difference between the two numbers is one. Either Alice's number is one larger than Bob's, or Bob's number is one larger than Alice's. Each of Alice and Bob can see the number on the other's forehead, but they can't see their own number. 
Okay, so they always tell the truth. In each one of the scenarios, Charlie writes a whole number on Alice and Bob's forehead. So Charlie writes on Alice and Bob's forehead, and those two numbers have a difference of one. Uh, either Alice is one bigger than Bob's, or Bob's is one bigger than Alice's, and Alice and Bob can see each other's numbers. So Charlie doesn't have a number on his forehead. Okay, cool. So Charlie writes a number on Alice and Bob's forehead, and... Uh, um, and he says, each of your numbers is at least one. The difference between the numbers is one. Alice then says, I know my number. Explain why Alice's number must be two. What is Bob's number? Okay, I've seen this problem, or this at least this, this type of problem before. So because each of their numbers are at least one, they know that they have positive integers on their forehead. Now, if Bob had any number greater than one, so if Bob had, let's say, a five on his forehead, then that means that Alice would not be able to deduce her number. It would have to be either four or six. However, since, um, so that, that logic applies. So if I make N any number that's at least two, Alice would not know if it was N minus one or N plus one. So she wouldn't be able to exclaim that she knew her number. But this logic only holds if N is at least two. And so since she is able to say what her number is, it must be that N, Bob's number, is one. And therefore, since Alice's number is one away and all the numbers are at least one, Alice's number must be two, Bob's number must be one. Okay, cool. How do I continue? Okay, Charlie now writes new numbers on their foreheads and says each of your numbers is between one and 10 inclusive. Let me get rid of all this writing. Um... The difference between the numbers is one. Alice's number is a prime, uh, and a, yeah, defines what a prime is. Alice then says, I don't know my number. Bob then says, I don't know my number. And we want to know what is Alice's number. Okay, so the difference between the numbers is one, and each of your numbers is prime. Okay, so they both have numbers on their foreheads, and the difference between their numbers is one. Alice's number is a is a prime. Okay, cool. So firstly, what could Alice's number be? It could be two, three, five, or seven. Um, my thought is it probably isn't near the ends because it, it kind of using a similar logic before. So it's probably five, but let's just explore this. So let's say Alice's number is two. We have no idea what, well, actually, yeah. So let, let's go with Bob's number again. Let's start from Bob's number. So if Alice's number is two, then Bob's would have to be one or three, let's say Bob's is three. Then if Bob's number was three or one, in fact, Alice would immediately know that her number is two because she knows it's prime and the only primes adjacent to one or three is two. So Bob's number cannot be one or three. Yeah, but maybe we just kind of list three Bob's numbers. I don't know if that's the most efficient way of doing this, but it will at least help us explore this problem. So Bob's number can't be one, it can't be three. Could Bob's number be two? No, Bob's number can't be two, because then again, the only prime adjacent to two is three. And so then Alice would know her number immediately. So it can't be two. Could Bob's number be four? Well, potentially, because both the prime, both numbers adjacent to four are primes, three and five. And so Alice would then say, ah, oh, I don't know my number. OK, so we'll keep four in the mix for now. Let's explore five. Could five be Bob's number? No, because neither number next to five is prime. What about six? Well, for six, we get a similar issue with four because both numbers next to six are prime. Okay, what about seven? Seven, no, there's no issue there. Bob's number can't be seven because no number next to seven is prime, so that would be impossible. How about eight? Uh, eight can't be Bob's number because if eight was Bob's number, then uh, the only prime next to it is seven, so Alice would immediately know her number. So it can't be eight. How about nine for Bob? Uh, no, because again, no number next to nine is prime. And could it be 10? No, because the only number next to 10 is nine in this problem and nine is not prime. So that couldn't be Bob's number. So Bob's number is either four or six. Okay, so Alice can see Bob's number. It's either four or six. So at this point, um, if it's four, let's say, then Alice is thinking it's her number is either three or five. So it's Alice's. Or if it's six that Alice sees, she's thinking her number's either five or seven. Okay, so she exclaims, I don't know my number. 
And then Bob says, I don't know my number after Alice has said this. So the fact once Alice says she doesn't know her number, we know, or Bob in theory, using this logic we just provided, Bob knows that uh, Alice must think that her number is three, five, or seven. Uh, and Bob and Bob's number must be either four or six. So yeah, so once Alice says, I don't know my number, Bob will immediately knows that his number is either four or six. Now, he can see Alice's number. If Alice's number was seven, he knows that his number has to be at most a one away, and so it has to be six. On the flip side, if Alice's number was three, Bob would know, well, his is one away, and it's either four or six, it has to be four. So we know that Alice's number can be neither three nor seven. Alice's number must be five. Now, that doesn't help us to determine what Bob's number is, but that's fine. We only want to know what Alice's number is. There's not enough information to know what Bob's number is. Alice's number must be five. Interesting. So these sorts of questions you normally see on the computer science part of the math, or at least in the old formats. It's interesting they've given them to math students. Anyway, let's look at the next part. Oh, what's it saying? You've not viewed the entire screen. What have I viewed? Don't know what I've not viewed. Okay. Uh, Charlie now writes new numbers on their foreheads and says, each of your numbers is between one and 10 inclusive. The difference between the numbers is one. Um, Alice then says, I don't know my number. Is my number a square number? Charlie then says, if I told you that, you would know your number. Bob then says, I don't know my number. What is Alice's number? Actually, cool. I Interesting scenario. Uh, let's 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 go through the same logic before it worked. Then um, I'm not actually too familiar with the techniques for these sorts of problems. So if anyone has done these in in a bit of depth, let me know in the comments uh, if you're still watching <laughs> how, what the technique is for for these sorts of problems, or if you have any special tips um, that you can share with other viewers. Let's let's have a look at this. So Charlie uh, now writes a number on each of their foreheads, one to ten exclusive. The difference between the numbers is one. Alice says, I don't know my number. Is my number a square number? Okay, so let's go through Bob's uh, numbers. So he could have one, two, three, four, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, so we know that Bob can't have a one or ten because if that was the case, Alice would immediately know her number. Okay, if Bob had a two on his head, that would break this prop scenario because if Bob had a two on his head, Alice would be able to see that uh, Bob has a two and Alice would immediately know that she has either a one or a three. But the great thing about that is one is square and three is not square. So if she did ask uh, Charlie um, that, then we would know what her number is. Oh, so in fact, uh, sorry, no, uh, she, she would know what her number is. So in fact, two is in the right name. Two could be her number, because if she'd found out whether it was square or not, she'd immediately be able to tell that her number's either one or three. OK, how about three? Similar thing there. The numbers next to three are two and four. Four is square, two is not. So three is one of these candidate numbers where uh, if she knows if Bob's number was three, her number's either two or four. So if she could find out whether it's square or not, she'd be able to determine whether it was two or four. So her Bob's number could still be three. Could it be four? No, because the numbers adjacent to four are three and five, and neither of them are square. So if she asked, so if she saw Bob's number is four, it'd be useless to her to ask if a number was square, because the, either way, if it was three or five, it wouldn't be. Um, for five, that would be useful because the number next to five is four. So if Bob's number was five, she knows she has a four or a six. So asking whether it was a square could be useful. It's not six, numbers next to it aren't square. Not seven, numbers next to it aren't square. Could still be eight because the number next to it, one of them is nine, one of them is seven, uh, but it can't be nine because the two numbers next to it are not square. Okay, cool. So we get to Bob's number is either two, three, five, or eight. So maybe a few more selections than in the last couple of instances. Okay. Charlie says, if I told you that, you will know your number. Bob then says, I don't know my number. Okay, what are the potential choices for Alice's number? So if it's if Bob's number was two, Alice could either have a one or three. 
If Bob's number was a three, Alice could either have a two or a four. If Bob's number was five, Alice can either have a four, Alice, you can either have a four or a six. And if Bob's number is eight, Alice can either have a seven or a nine. Okay, cool. Um, how do we uh, how do we dissect this? Maybe we just look at one scenario at a time. Let's look at this. So if Bob has two, then Alice knows she has either one or three. Um, let's say Alice has one. Well, Alice can't have one because Bob would know his number from the get-go. It would have to be two. So Alice can't have one. And similarly, Alice can't have nine. Cool. Could Alice have three? Um, well, then that would mean that Bob's number is either two or four. But we've already established that Bob's number couldn't be four. Um, and so Alice, and Bob's number would have to be two. And so he would then know his number. So, yeah, so Alice's number can't be three. Could Alice's number be two? Well, again, then if Alice's number was two, we'd know that Bob's number would either be one or four. Uh, of one or three, sorry, but then Bob would know his number because three is still or three. One is no longer available, so three is up for grabs. So by this point, because he can see Alice's number, if it was two, he'd know that his number is three. But that's not the case because Bob doesn't know his number, so Alice can't be two. Could Alice be four? If Alice was four, if Alice's number was four, Bob would see that and he would know that his number is either three or five. Ah, that's potential there because both of those numbers are up for grabs. Okay, what about over here? If Alice is four, well, we get the same logic. What if it's Alice is six? If Alice is six, then that means Bob is either five or seven, but seven we've already ruled out and five is up for grabs. So Bob would know that he was five. And so it can't be that because Bob doesn't know his number. And what about for seven? Well, if Alice was seven, that means Bob is either six or eight. Six has already been ruled out. So Bob would know he'd be eight. So it can't be that. And so therefore Alice's number is four. Amazing. Alice's number is four and then Bob's is uh three or five um it can be either of those i think um cool let's continue i think i need to scroll across on both of these for it to let me continue yeah okay new question ah the gregorian calendar this is one of my favorite problems for the mat it's one from one of the or if it's the same problem i'm thinking of is from one of the old mats maybe 2011 2012 question fives um so this question concerns dates of the form d1 d2 slash m1 m2 slash y1 y2 y3 y4 in the order day month year the question specifically concerns those dates which contain no repetitions of a digit for example the date 2305 1967 is one such date but 07 12 1974 is not such a date because the first month which is one is the same as the first year digit. And also we get two seven. Uh, cool. So we want dates in this form, which uh, can't be repeated. So we will use the Gregorian calendar throughout. This is the calendar system that is standard through most of the world. Um, so yeah, the days can be from zero one up to 31 in some months and uh, the months are from one to 12, zero one to zero, uh, to zero one to 12. And the years can be any string of four digits except zero 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 uh okay i guess it could be zero 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 anyway oh uh, let's look at the question uh show that there is a no date with no repetition of digits in the years from 2000 to 2099 um yeah hopefully that's pretty clear because uh well i say it, hopefully it's pretty clear Let, let's do some experimentation so Where's the why is the pen thing showing? Okay, there we go. Um, so two thousand to two thousand and ninety nine was it? Yeah. So two thousand two thousand ninety nine. Well, let's look at two thousand to two thousand and ten. Well, in fact, oh well, all of them are gonna. Sorry, two thousand. Well, two thousand to two thousand and nine. They're all gonna have two zeros in the year, so we can exclude those. What about two thousand and ten to two thousand and 19 we'll notice that they all have 201 in the first three spots of the year and if we think about the month the month has to begin with either a zero or a one so the zeros and ones are going to repeat um there's going to be at least two zeros or at least two ones um 
Okay, what about if we go to 2020? Um Obviously, it can't be 2020, it's got two zoos in, so we can skip straight to 2030 with that logic. Um, and now the issue is, well, we've got two zeros and threes. So if you think about the dates and the months, the month we know has to start, so if, it's, if we have day, day, month, month, year, 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 um, we know that if we're looking at 2030, 203, the only digit we're left for is one there, but then we can't put anything in that. Zero, one, and two don't fit. So it can't be 2030. How about 2040? Well, in fact, we'll get the same issue. We've got two zero at the start. Okay, in fact, that's the, that's the issue here. So we've got two zero for, from the years from 2000 to 2099. They both begin with two zero. And so if we look at the month part of this, M1, M2, this would be forced to be one, but then this guy has no fill. Cool. So that's the issue here. So there's no dates between 2000 and 2099. No problem. Let's continue. What was the last date before today with no repetition of digits? Explain your answer. Okay, so we know it's going to be before 2000. Let's just work backwards. It can't be 1999, can't be 1990, can't be 1990s, can it be 1980 something? Well, that's potential there, except we've used up, oh, if we go 1989, we can't do, oops. 1990, we can't do. 1989, we can't do. 1988, we can't do. Two eights. Maybe 1987. So if we work like this, the month would have to be zero something. We can come back to that in a moment. And the date would have to start with a two or two or a three. So, well, actually, it can't start with a three because it has to be either 30 or 31, but we've used zero and one. So 20. And in fact, this seems like it works. We've got four, five, and six to play with that we can put anywhere here. So we're looking for the most recent date. So that's going to be the latest month. We're going to prioritize that. So June and then the latest day. So the 25th of June, 1987, I believe, would be the answer there. Okay. Okay, when will the next such date be? So we know it's going to be at least 2,100. And obviously, it can't be 2,100, can't be 2,101, it repeats the 1, can't be 2,102, can't be 2,103, that's used 210. In fact, I don't think it can be anything from up to 2,109, because that uses all the date, well, it uses 0 and 1, right? So that's not, not very useful to us, um, if you think about the first month, uh, first digit of the month. Okay, so we have to go to at least 2,110, so 11, 12, 13, probably 14. 2,114, we've got two ones there, so we need to skip ahead to 20. Well, not 20, because we've got two, three, um, and let's go to four, because we can't use zero there. Um, okay, then you're going to get the issue of the, the month will have to start with a zero, but then you'll have nothing for your date to begin with. So... Let's get to 214. Maybe there's something here. So if we go 214, the month has to begin with a zero. The day has to begin with a three, but then you can't put anything there. So you can't go 214. In fact, you're going to struggle. If you put one in the year, you have to put zero there. And because two is the start number, you'd have to put three here and you arrive at the same issue. So we need to get rid of this one. So we need to skip ahead to 2200. But that's got two twos in so we've got to skip to 2300 so 2300 and something and now we have a bit more to play with so we can put either zero one here and the other one has to go here at the start of the day and i think we've got enough here we've got four five six seven eight nine which can go pretty much anywhere except if that's a one of in fact that can't be a one because october november december they're one zero one 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 two we haven't got those digits left so that has to be zero that has to be one. Okay, we want the earliest date. So maybe we're going to prioritize the year. So we've got what? Four, five, six. Let's go four, five, uh, 45. We'll go the, that's the earliest year. Earliest month is June. Um, and we've got the earliest date would be 17 then. So the 17th of June, 2345 would be the next such date. Sweet.
Okie dokie. That's the next part. Okay, how many such dates were there in the years from 1900 to 1999? Okay, well, what was the answer for what we had? I think we had 25th of June, 1987. That was what we had as the last date to be of this form. Okay, how many dates? I think I maybe want to split this between decades to start with. So in 1900 to 1909, there are none because they all use one and zero. In fact, let, let's be a bit smart about this. We know any date in this period is going to start one nine. And so that forces the month to begin with a zero. And so that forces the date, the day to start with two because it can't start with a three. Um, okay. So now we know that there's not going to be anything in the 1900 to 1910 decade, nothing in the 1910 to 1920, nothing in 1920 to 1930. Maybe we can start from 1930. So how many dates are there if we go in 1930s? Then 1930s. Um, well, now we've got four, five, six, seven, one, two, three, three spaces to fill. And that can be any digits from four, five, six, seven, eight. Yeah. So four spaces to fill, four, five, six, seven, eight. Four, five, six, seven, eight. So that's eight, uh, five numbers. And we've got one, two, three spaces to fill. So there's five, choose three. And I think they can go in any order. Um, yeah. So that's going to give you five, choose three ways to do it in the 1930s. Let's put that there. How about the 1940s? Now you're going to get this, a similar thing, I reckon. So it's got to be something like that. And then, okay, now you've got three, five, six, seven, eight to play with, still five numbers, and they can go in any order you want. So again, you're going to get five, choose three. And so it'd be the same for 1950s, 1960s, 1970s, 1980s. Um, I'm just checking, I don't want to make, I want to make sure I'm not rushing this. Yeah. These digits here, this digit can be anything now, uh, and so can this guy, and so can this guy. Yeah, so you're going to get 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. So that's going to give you six decades, each of which are five choose three. Five choose three is five times four over two, which is 10. So this is going to be 60. There's going to be 60 dates between 1900 to 1999, um, which has yeah uh, this nice form. Uh, obviously, we don't have to look at 1990 because that's got two nines in it. Um, cool. Oh, and that is the end of the paper. So, what, 38 minutes to spare. I mean, I wasn't doing this super on the clock, but I guess also in reality in the real exam, I'd go back and check this. Um, but wow, that's the first time I've done an exam in a while in somewhat exam conditions in the sense that we're obviously chatting through it and um whatnot but yeah an interesting one i probably made some mistakes in there so obviously don't don't take my uh my solutions for granted uh do, do check if they're if they're right um i will try when i'm editing this to uh to go through them but i want to get this video video out as soon as possible so hopefully let me know in the comments if i made any mistakes here i'm gonna sit down and let my brain unfry for a bit um, but yeah, good luck for anyone who's doing the mat here. Um, if the format seems absolutely rubbish, if I'm completely honest. Um, if it's if it's how it was today, we had to kind of scroll across and scroll up and down. There's so much empty space. Um, that I think that is really, really bad. Um, it's all moved online for whatever reason. Uh, stop cheating or try and reduce it or make it more accessible or whatever they have, make it cheaper to produce. Who knows? Um and they're doing this with lots of admissions tests. But anyway, uh, not uh, not my favorite paper to do online. I've had uh, online papers before. They just kind of send you a PDF. And that, that, that seems to work well. And you write in your answers and you scan them in. Obviously, maybe not everyone has a scanner. I don't know. It's not my problem to solve. But I don't think this is an amazing solution. Um, anyway, let's go back to the paper. Hopefully, you enjoyed uh, my solutions. Um, hopefully, they made sense. You may need to go over bits um, of the solution again. Let me stop sharing my screen and talk to you, big face. Uh, you may have to go through some of the solutions in a bit more depth. 
Uh, obviously, I was doing it as I would in an exam. Obviously, I still have 35 or so minutes to spare. I'd go back and check my answers, um, which obviously I'd encourage you to do. But my advice for anyone who is actually doing the mat, uh, one of the best things I could say is read through the questions first. Obviously, if it, with this online format, it's a little bit difficult to do that. But when you open the paper, go through and read the questions first. So all the multiple choice ones. So have a read them. Maybe make a, a note on a piece of paper, any techniques you think might be useful um, so maybe you think, ah, oh, question 17, I need to use completing the square or something. Make make a note of that. Um, and then also read the long questions as well. And the reason I'd recommend that is because two things. Firstly, you will never really know there could be an easier question later on. Normally, the questions go in increasing order of difficulty, but obviously that's subjective. So maybe there's a certain area which you find a lot easier than others. And that could be later in the paper. And obviously you want to be answering that if you think you're going to get it correct. Um, I mean, obviously, you're going to answer every question because there's no negative marking, but obviously you want to try and answer that question correctly if you think that you can. Um, so I'd say definitely try and uh, go through um, uh, go through uh, the paper first, maybe spend five, 10 minutes just reading every question. And also the second reason that's useful is because your subconscious will be working on the problem. So if you read all 25 questions and start again from the beginning, you'll without even realizing your brain will be working on question five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, And by the time you get to question five, you'll go, oh yeah, maybe this is the trick I need um, and things like that. Anyway, if you have made it to the end of this video, <laughs> thank you very much. This is by far the longest video I've ever filmed. I think the longest video of my channel is about half an hour. Also a very different video to what I normally film. So uh, let me know if you, if you want to see more of me doing exams, doing tests. Uh, I don't know. I'm going to stop rambling on. Uh, best of luck for anyone doing the that. And I'll catch you in the next one. Have a great day.